Hi everyone, so we're back with a video. This particular video, we're gonna talk about a very important concept, and that is molecule transport. Because when we talk about the cells and how our cells work, how our tissues work and organs work, everything kind of depends on either getting nutrients or actually um, how we can bring things in out of the cell. So let's take a look at some of the concepts that are very important that regards to molecule movement. Okay, so if you've ever um, put some Kool-Aid in a cup of water or just dropped something in that was colorful in a body of water, immediately what you notice is that it starts to dis you know, dissipate and starts to spread out. Now, the reason why we see that is because molecules like to follow concentration gradients. Now, what in the world is a concentration gradient? That means things want to go from an area of high concentration. So we see here, let's say this is a uh, sugar molecule or sodium or something. We see these molecules here. There are a lot over this region. Now, typically, it wants to go from that high concentrated area to a lower area. So going from high to low concentrations, we call following a concentration gradient. That pretty much drives a lot of the processes that we see. Um, when we talk about molecule transport, let's say we're talking about diffusion or those passive type transports, this is what is followed. Okay, so first we're going to start with the mechanisms of passive transport. The first one is just basic diffusion. So diffusion is, it follows once again the concentration gradient. So if you look here, we have a solution that contains a lot of molecules in there. You see there is a membrane, a semi-permeable membrane that's found separating the two areas. So we have the concentrated area, a semi-permeable membrane, and another area where the molecules would want to go. So if you're taking a look at this picture, you see that there's a lot of the concentrated molecules that need to move. And you see here, there's not as many. So over time, because it follows that rule of going from high to low, it will reach an equilibrium. So we will have our molecules going through until they are balanced on both sides. So that is reaching an equilibrium. Now this automatically will occur because it wants to go from high to low and if these molecules are small enough, are not charged or anything that will prevent it from going through the membrane, it will go through. This does not require any type of energy. It doesn't require ATP. So that's why this is um, a passive transport known as diffusion. So you'll have molecules diffused from an area of high to low between a semi-permeable membrane. Okay, so let's take a look at another passive transport mechanisms that molecules can use to get across. Now we saw a video looking at the cell membrane um, proteins, and if you hadn't seen that video, you can go ahead and take a look at it. But the cell membrane proteins, we do have some that serve as carrier proteins that can help bring molecules across the membrane. Some molecules may not be able to go freely on its own. So this uh, mechanism of transporting molecules across the membrane, still following a gradient, um, is called facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport. Okay, so once again, remember that facilitated diffusion or facilitated transport, since we're still following a concentration gradient and the molecules need to get through, they're maybe not as tiny as the smaller molecules that can pass through diffusion on its own. These particular ones may have maybe a little bit larger, they may be insoluble. So for that matter, they need to be brought across. So here we see facilitated transport, facilitated diffusion. It does not require ATP. So no ATP. This is why it's still considered a passive transport mechanism. This diagram here is actually comparing the passive transport mechanisms that I just mentioned. So if we take a look at diffusion, here we have an oxygen molecule that needs to cross through a semi-permeable membrane. Oxygen can easily go through until we 
get an equilibrium. So it will go from an area to, of high to low concentration. And we typically see this, let's say we're talking about a red blood cell. We know red blood cells have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin helps bind iron or iron is associated with the hemoglobin. And that in turn will allow oxygen to exchange. So this type of gas exchange is a passive response that doesn't require ATP. Now if we take a look at let's say sodium or other molecules that may be a little bit larger, they may need help crossing over the membrane. So we have some kind of protein, it could be a carrier protein or channel protein that will allow it to go through. This too is still passive, it does not require ATP. If we take a look here, there's something going on slightly different. This is called active transport. All right, so to mention the passive transport follows that, uh, that concentration gradient where things want to go from an area of high to low. Active transport may actually be the opposite. So it tends to go against the concentration gradient. You may have, um, let's say if you have a higher concentration of molecules here, but you want to bring that same molecule in that direction, it's going to not want to do that because remember it's going against the concentration gradient. So that's going to require some kind of force or some kind of change to get the molecule across. So that will require ATP to cause it to work. That is called active transport. You're actively using ATP um, that will allow molecules to go through. So remember that there are passive and active transports. The passive goes, it follows the concentration gradient from high to low. Active typically goes the other direction, going against the gradient. So that requires ATP for the molecule to move across. Now, the one that we see in a textbook a lot that we regarding or we talk about regarding active transport is the sodium potassium pump because you actually have to pump and move things across. Okay, so when we're talking about movement of molecules through a membrane, it can happen by three different transport types. We have a uniporter, which you can have um, molecules going in through one direction, a symporter, where you can have more than one molecule going through in the same direction. And then an antiporter where you can have molecules moving. You'll have one going in, one going out in opposite directions. So these are just different, three different types of transport mechanism. Uniporter, where you have one going in one direction. Symporter, where you can get two molecules going in the same direction through the channel. And antiporter, where you have two molecules going through, but they're going through opposite directions. Now I found this picture and I thought this would be a good lead-in to osmosis. Here we see this dog, I'm going to call him solutes. You know solutes are like salts and things that you dissolve in an actual liquid base. Um, so here's this dog solute, he has a ball. Here's another dog, I'm calling this dog water. Okay, so water is chasing this dog named solute. And the reason why I showed you this is because there is an important concept that I want you to know. When we talk about movement of water, that term is osmosis. When we talk mo about movement of water, there is one principle that you need to always remember based on this picture, is that water follows solutes, okay? Water follows solutes. Okay, so this is showing you that important rule that water follows solutes. Here we have two beakers. Each beaker has a semi-permeable membrane. You remember through the rules of diffusion, technically we have our molecules wanting to move from areas from high to low. Well, when we talk about osmosis, water kind of follows wherever the solutes go. So if you have high levels of solutes, so if you take a look here, there's a lot of solutes on this side of the membrane where there's very little. And remember, water will follow solutes. So if we take a look what will happen over time, look at the water volume here. It's, it's kind of high, but when we look over here over time, we see the water volume goes down, whereas this water volume goes up. 
just because there's more solutes on that side. So how can we apply this? Well, if you eat something super, super salty or super, super sweet, you know you are always getting thirsty because you know water follows solutes. Um, another way to kind of remember this, you know, sometimes women, when that time of the month comes and they get bloated, well, typically around that time of the month, um, women tend to hold on to a lot more sodium. So if they hold on to sodium, guess what they're going to hold on to? Water. So that was that's what caused that water bloating. Also, the urinary system, you know, one way how we actually, you know, how we absorb back water if we need it for dehydrating is that the body actually will hold on to more sodium so the body will also hold on to water if you want to take a look at what's going on there with the escritory system please take a look at that video okay so let's apply those principles that we just saw talking about water following solutes so here we're using the human red blood cell or red blood cell as an example of how osmosis or the movement of water in relation to concentration of solutes work. So if we're looking at a hypertonic solution, so we're looking over here, um, if we put a cell, let's say a human cell, in a beaker or in some kind of solution that has a lot more solutes than inside the cell, like taking your cell and putting it in a really salty solution, the water is going to follow the solutes. So if there's more salts or more solutes outside of the cell, in a hypertonic, hyper means above, the water will rush out of the cell, um, causing the cell to shrink. So in a hypertonic solution, water leaves the cell because there's more solutes outside of the cell. When we look at an isotonic solution, Iso means the same, okay? So in an isotonic solution, you take your cell and let's say you put it in IV solution because IV solution is isotonic. So if you take a look, that means that the inside and the outside of the cell will have very similar concentration of solutes. So if it's pretty much equivalent, equal inside and outside, the water exchange will be even so the cell won't shrink like we saw with the hypertonic solution now when we look at the hypotonic the hypotonic means you're taking um you know let's say a cell and you put it in a beaker of distilled water you know distilled water really doesn't have any solutes in it so in a hypotonic solution Hypo means low or less, okay? So if you put a cell in the hypotonic solution, that means that there will be more solutes inside the cell than it is outside. And if we follow the principle of water follows solutes, the water will rush into the cell, bursting it, okay? So if we take a look at all three together, remember water follows solutes. In a hypertonic solution, there's more solutes outside, so the water is going to leave and go outside. In an isotonic solution, there are equal solute concentrations, so evenly exchanged. Where hypotonic, um, there's less outside, so it rushes inside. Okay, it's that time. It is time for the quiz. Let's see how much information you retained. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture right here. All right, water is equally flowing in and out of the cell. What solution is the red blood cell in? So water's evenly exchanging. Is it isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic? Hopefully you picked isotonic. Remember that if um, the solute concentration is the same in versus out, you'll have even exchange of the water and the cell will retain its shape. Okay, so let's take a look at this cell. Water is being released from, uh, from this or these red blood cells. What solution is this cell in? Is it isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic? So look at the arrow. The arrow is showing movement out. That means water is leaving the cell. If you said that it is a hypertonic solution, you are correct. Next one. Which transport system moves molecules against a gradient utilizing ATP? Is it facilitated, active transport, simple diffusion, or osmosis? So it's utilizing ATP and it's moving molecules against a gradient. So 
That means you have to force it across. And that means it is active transport. Hopefully you got that. Next one, the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane is called, so the movement of water, is it called facilitated diffusion transport, active transport, simple diffusion, osmosis, or none of the above? Hopefully you picked osmosis because that is the movement of water. So hopefully you did well in this quiz. It was just a very simple concept that I wanted you to understand is how molecules can transport or move across membranes. And those can include like, you know, proteins, ions, even water. How can it move? And so hopefully you learned that principle that water follows solute. So just leave a comment down below. And let me know if this video was helpful or if you learned any concepts or even if you just did well on the quiz. I would love to hear from you. So until next time, bye.